Hello and welcome. Moss Adams is pleased that you joined us for today's session, 2023 Fall Not-for-Profit Tax Update. Before we begin, I'm going to play our housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today, we'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our Group CPE Attendance Sheet, available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. Today's presenters from Moss Adams are Maggie Elliott, Senior Manager, and Colleen Ramirez, also a Senior Manager here at Moss Adams. Their bios and contact information are located in your webcast console for your convenience. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to Maggie to get the presentation started. Thank you, Danielle. Welcome, everybody. Really appreciate you joining us this morning. Today's presentation, here's our agenda. We will cover the regulatory provisions affecting tax-exempt organizations. We will go over briefly the state of the IRS. We'll cover congressional hot topics and hopefully we'll have time to cover some additional hot topics um, at the end. And with that, I will kick us off and turn it back over to Danielle for our first polling question. Thank you, Maggie. Today's first poll is your organization planning on adding energy efficient materials to your building? A yes, B no, C maybe, B not applicable. The polling questions are located right on the slides we are presenting. If you can't see it, uh, please take a look below and find the icon that says slides. If you still cannot see the poll, you can hit F5 to refresh your console. To respond, please click the button next to your answer you choose and make sure you hit that button that says submit. And I'll leave this open for a few more seconds. and the results. Okay, so it looks like uh, about 57%, so majority here are uh, either yes or a maybe, which means that you're at least thinking about energy efficient uh, improvements. So that's great to see. And so starting off with the regulatory provisions affecting the tax exempt organizations, one of the biggest um, impacts, I think, was from the Inflation Reduction Act of 22, 2022 that was signed into law on August 16th of last year. Um, the also included Energy Efficiency Materials, materials Program, which provides ability 
for grants up to $200,000 for non-for-profits. 50 million was set aside for that. Also for installing energy efficient materials in a non-for-profit building that's operated and owned by an organization under section 501c3. Um, the materials and the installation of these materials, including products, equipment, and systems are related and generally would include things like roofs and lighting. So for roofing solar panels, solar panels are a great example, energy efficiency windows, doors, including a security do door, HVAC systems, and a lot more information if you're interested is provided at the link that's on the slide below. And so going back to the Inflation Reduction Act that I mentioned, many of these tax credits are now eligible for direct payment, and they include clean vehicle credits, investment tax credit, and that's a tax credit that reduces tax liability by a determined amount. So for example, 30% of the total cost of a solar system that an organization would be installing is possibly eligible, and that would be a lump sum one-off credit. The production tax credit is a per kilowatt hour tax credit for electricity generated by wind energy or other qualifying technologies which does include solar as well. And this would be for the first 10 years of a system's operation. The Inflation Reduction Act also introduced a 15% corporate alternative minimum tax. So the AMT is back. Um, however, for tax exempt organizations, this would really only apply to those entities with adjusted financial statement income over 1 billion of unrelated business income. The act also extended Section 179D deduction, which is an energy efficient commercial building deduction. It also permits allocation of tax deduction of up to $1.80 per square foot to the primary designer of energy efficient buildings or systems in lieu of the owner. And lastly, it now extended to buildings owned by exempt organization and tribal governments Previously, this was only allowed for buildings owned by the US government, state, and local. So the direct paid election, you're seeing here on this slide the applicable entities, but the direct pay really is a game changer for nonprofits as it allows them the qualifying tax exempt, as it allows the qualifying tax exempt entities to receive a direct payment from the IRS in lieu of a tax credit. Therefore, it gives these nonprofits access to the same financial incentives that for for-profit companies had and received when investing in renewable energy. Before the IRA, entities really had no that had no tax liability could not access federal clean energy tax credits for their projects. There were a few workarounds. Um, you could, for example, transfer the credits to a taxable entities, uh, but those typically involved complex financial setups. Many nonprofits, for example, would lease or install their solar, solar panels through a power purchasing agreement, well, what's called a PPA, with a tax liable third party that would take on these tax credits. So here are the applicable entities, as I mentioned, and what's important to highlight here at the very bottom is that the partnerships currently are not applicable. So even if the partnership had all tax exempt partners, that would be a disqualifier. There has been multiple comments submitted. Um, so hopefully we'll still see some changes uh, with respect to that but um, that's yet to come. So keep that in mind, even if you if multiple tax exempt entities created a partnership that would disqualify them from this election. And with that, I will turn it over again. We have our second polling question, Danielle. Thank you, Maggie. So poll question number two, have you received any IRS correspondence this year? A, yes, B, no, C, not applicable. You do have the option to submit questions for the presenters in the Q&A window. We have quite a bit of content to cover today, so if we don't have time to respond during the webcast, we will do our best to follow up with you afterwards.
And I'll go ahead and leave this up for a few more seconds, get a few more of those responses in. And the results. Thank you. Okay, so it does look like uh, a big, pretty evenly split actually between yes and no, 44% about for each. Um, the IRS has not been my favorite friend uh, recently. And while they've received a lot of funding, um, there still continue to be issues. I'm sure many of you that are dealing with the notices and a lot of these notices have been pervasive and for issues that have been stemming over and continuing over multiple years before we were able to resolve them. But reflecting back on fiscal year 2022 and IRS exam activity, overall 3,425 3, total reviews occurred, including the Form 990 series and their associated employment and excise tax returns. 2,000 of those exams were referred and that's the interesting part is that the IRS does actually follow up on all the referrals and they do seem to do most of these exams as a result of a referral. They were closed with a change of 78%. And what that means that there was some kind of adjustment for 78% of those reviews that resulted. The issues of focus, unrelated business income, excise taxes, employment tax issues, including employee misclassification and taxable fringe benefits. The employment tax issues continue to be uh, looked into, and we see that very, very often with uh, organizations, just because it's a great re revenue driver for the IRS. And typically, if they're reviewing the 990, they will ask about the compensation or in reverse, if they were to look employment tax issues, they could sometimes pull in other um, issues such as the 990. Private benefit and inurement, of course, continues to be focused. Um, they started also running queries for the 990N filing eligibility. Uh, they have noted that a lot of organizations that did not actually qualify for the form 990N were filing that. So that continues to be a focus. And then, the most prominent issues found in closed compliance strategy examinations relate to, as I mentioned, employment taxes, operational requirements, and self-dealing for private, within private foundations. In the hospital sector, however, there were 1,260 reviews of hospital Schedule H filings, which is about a third of the total population. 67 of those exams were referred. So as you can see, that's a much smaller number here. And they closed 58% or 58 of these exams with a change rate of 60%. Issues of focus, community benefits standard, compliance with filing forms 941 and 990T. Um, they closed 19 exams on form 990T with an 89% change rate, which was pretty high. And main issues um, we continue to see is expense allocation methods and expenses in excess of gross income, as well as the net operating loss adjustments. So the compliance strategies from prior years um, were typically focused on syndicated conservation easements, abusive charitable remainder trust, COVID-19 related employer credits, and we'll cover those at the end, hopefully with under hot topics, potentially abusive promoter schemes, which again, where a lot of them were linked to the employer retention tax credits, exams of high income taxpayers. So for example, a private foundation that gets pulled in as part of an estate audit, for example, private benefit and inurement. So again, that's focused on private foundations and loans to disqualified persons. We see that commonly. And they lev they're leveraging technology and data analytics, including publicly available data to try to you know, improve their processes and streamline. They're also hoping to improve operational efficiency and develop the tax exempt government entities workforce. 
So priorities for fiscal year 2024, this has been a bit of a change in how they typically have provided those. They're really trying to align with the objective of the IRS strategic operating plan as an overall IRS plan to address the underreporting through expanded examinations. And so the IRS focus, and that includes now the TEGE, is better taxpayer experience, which I'm sure we could all um, benefit from. Faster issue resolution. Again, as I mentioned, a lot of these issues take a very long time to resolve. Smarter enforcement, so that's really relying on their advanced technology and analytics and empowered employees. One of the increased focus, which comes up a lot, is exams, again, of the high income taxpayers and tax exempt entity issues. So the priority guidance plan, um, there are four items here. So regulations under section 512 regarding the allocation of expenses and computing our related business taxable income and addressing how the changes made to section 172 net operating losses from the CARES Act apply for the purposes of section 512. We've been waiting for those, as well as the guidance under Section 4941 regarding a private foundation's investment in a partnership in which disqualified persons are also partners. Um, also hoping for guidance, um, revising the revenue procedures of 80-27 regarding group exemption letters. Uh, notice 2020-36 was published on May 18th, and no word of further guidance there. And then notice 2021-56 contains the circumstances under which an LLC can qualify for recognition under 501c3. Uh, priority guidance plan drop this item and no further LLC guidance is expected there. And with that, Danielle, we have another polling question. Thank you, Maggie. Poll question number three for today, did your organization qualify for the employee retention tax credit? A, yes, B, no, C, not applicable, D, I don't know, should I investigate? As a reminder, if you'd like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of our four polling questions. I'll keep the poll up here for a few more moments. and the results. All right, so this is Colleen. Hi, uh, great to be here with you all today. So results from this, um, it looks like it's about a third yes, a third no, um, and then the rest either not applicable or you're not sure, should I investigate? I would say yes, it's worth investigating. Um, we will go into more information on this later when we um, talk about the hot topics. Um, so now we're gonna go over some congressional hot topics um, that have gotten um, attention over the last year or two. Um, that can, will likely have an impact on tax exempt organizations. Uh, these topics include 501c4 organizations and political and lobbying activities, um, tax exempt hospital organizations in the community benefit standards, um, and then also donor advised funds and um, the interaction with private foundations and donor advised funds. So first we'll go into 501c4 organizations and political activities. So just gonna kind of give some quick high level background to kind of explain of how we got to where we are today. So 501c4 organizations are allowed to engage in political campaign intervention. However, they must continue to be primarily engaged in activities that promote social welfare. Now, primarily engaged is in quotes because we don't necessarily have a definitive definition of what that means 
what the threshold of activities is for what's considered to be, you know, substantially doing political campaign intervention, what does it mean to be, you know, what's the threshold for primarily engaged in social welfare. Then in 2010, there were two cases, Citizens United and SpeechNow.org um, versus the FEC. And from this, it allowed 501c4 organizations to make independent expenditures, electioneering communications, and make contributions to super PACs. Also around this time, you may remember, is when the IRS started adding additional scrutiny when it was looking at these fours and considering um, its exemption. That um, scrutiny was made public in 2013, and there was definitely a lot of backlash to that. Um, Congress did add a writer to appropriation bill that prevented the IRS from spending any funds to issue, revise, or finalize any regulations, revenue rulings, or other guidance relating to the standard used to determine whether a 501c4 group was really operating for social welfare, and it's been getting renewed year after year. So the IRS's hands are pretty tied as far as what they can do in providing guidance on this. Um, then the PATH Act was passed in 2015, and it essentially changed how 501c4 organizations can have exemption. Before, they could just file the 990 and kind of essentially do check the box of this is what we are. Now there is a notice of registration that has to be filed within 60 days. Um, the organizations were never required to file Form 1024. Um, it was an option, and it still is an option, but it's not a requirement. Um, so then in May 2022, the Senate Finance Committee held a public hearing um, in relation to political campaign and lobbying activities of tax-exempt organizations. So the examination was of current laws and enforcement governing these activities and those primarily of 501c4 organizations. Getting back to is the allowance of 501c4 organizations to do political campaign activities, is it being, you know, are they still being primarily engaged for social welfare or is this maybe being kind of taken advantage of and, you know, being used a little too liberally. Before this um, hearing, there was a report that was issued by the Senate Finance, um, and in that was stated that there's difficulty in determining whether a particular activity is prohibited political activity or permissible issue of advocacy. This could relate to 501c organizations who are, or C3 organizations, who are allowed to do lobbying, but are not allowed at all to do any kind of political campaign activities. It, it, will, it can lose its exempt status for doing such. Um, also, there is the issue of um, attribution of political activities to a 501c3. So this example, if the executive of the organization or the president or chair of the board was involved in political activities, you know, how is it made clear that they are acting in their own personal capacity and not acting in their role as a, you know, board member or executive or somebody that has quite a lot of influence of the 501c3 organization. And then also just kind of talked a little bit about some of the relationship between 501c3s and 501c4s and some concerns about that. And then this year, the House Ways and Means Committee Chair and Oversight Committee Subcommittee Chair released the request for information in August of this year, essentially asking tax exempt groups and the public to provide input and comments on current IRS requirements and whether there needs to be further guidance to clarify the use of, you know, 501c4 organizations. Um, the concerns were uh, campaign donations flowing through C4 organizations, kind of as I mentioned before, was, was, was that kind of being, the allowance for that is kind of being taken advantage of, 
um, foreign funds flowing through these organizations for political purposes and funds being used for personal expenses. Um, it did, one of the specific questions was, would it help to have updated guidance on the political campaign intervention definition and to what extent a 501c4 organization may do such activities? Um, I do think that that is likely something that would be desired because it is a little bit squishy in, you know, what exactly, you know, primarily involved in um, means. Uh, what else would be helpful to have the IRS provide guidance on? There was a request for comments on voter education or registration activities that are suspected to have kind of had an effect of seeming to favor a political um, a political um, person or or candidate or a group of candidates. And then also, should there be changes on the Form 990 reporting? to provide more clarity and to provide more, um, not attention, but to provide more kind of disclosure of what 501c4s were doing. Responses were requested um, by September 2023, so that obviously is passed. Um, so we will see what um, comes out of that. Um, so the next hot topic is uh, taxes and hospitals and the community benefit standards. Um, hospital tax exemption is, you know, strongly um, granted for it benefiting and taking care of the health of its community, thus the community benefit standard um, that is in place, and thus why when there is attention on tax exempt hospitals, this is what the attention is on. There is a long history of scrutiny that has come um, from Congress, so this isn't this isn't necessarily a recent development, um, but it has kind of resurfaced, I would say, um, as part of in the past with the you know history of the scrutiny. Um, there was a 501R, which was a new IRC section that was included in the Affordable Care Act that was passed in 2010. And Section 501R requires that um, hospital organizations with hospital facilities conduct a community health needs assessment once every three years, um, you know, do a implementation plan of how they're going to address the needs that were identified in that community health needs assessment, certain financial assistance policy requirements, and certain billing and collection requirements. Um, this topic is also getting a lot of public attention with new, news articles and reports that are coming out. So this spring in April of 2023, um, the oversight or the subcommittee on oversight of the House Ways and Means Committee did have a hearing regarding the community benefits that are being provided and how they are being reported. I do think that that how community benefits are being reported, how they're being tracked, you know, how they may be being tracked by organizations may be part of not everything's being captured or not everything is being clearly kind of communicated in the 990 of what benefits are being provided. And so I do think that that's part of this, I guess, issue is that there's probably more that's happening than is being um, that is being you know put out there or being seen. Um, so the committee focused on reporting discrepancies of community benefits. Um, again, you know, for the most part, like the Medicare reporting, that's pretty straightforward. But you get into some of the other you know types of community benefits and. Maybe one organization is better at tracking it than another organization has, or maybe they interpret what can be included different than another. And so then it's not, you're not comparing apples to apples. You may be comparing apples to bananas to oranges, and that's really hard to kind of establish and see, you know, which hospitals are exceeding and doing kind of, you know, providing the benefits that they need to and which uh, maybe are lacking. Um, also, they discussed potential um, solutions, 
they also focus on the compensation of CEOs. Then, just a couple months ago, in October, the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee released a report. Um, the report criticized tax-exempt hospitals for insufficient charity care and for excessive executive compensation. Um, it called on Congress to um, strengthen uh, the minimum standards for charity care, to establish clear enforceable standards for financial assistance programs, um, and define uh, the community engagement necessary to maintain tax exemption. Um, and I kind of see this as we had 501R that was put into place to kind of help improve this, to kind of be like, you need to do these things to show that you have a focus on community benefit and that we believe these, you know, requirements, policy changes being in place will lead to the community benefit that we are expecting happening. I think maybe that that is being looked at and being like, okay, we're not quite getting where we wanted to be. So there is a focus on let's provide maybe more standard, more clear, like these are what you need to do and have them be, you know, more kind of enforceable. Like right now, if you don't, if a hospital organization doesn't do a community health needs assessment, there is a $50,000 excise tax. If the financial assistance plans or billing and collection plans, you know, requirements aren't met, there is not an excise tax related to that. A organization can lose its tax exempt status, but that's if there is willful neglect. Um, and that's kind of generally the extreme um, that, you know, we would see. I think there's only been a couple to a handful that this has happened to. Um, it also stated that the IRS could improve uh, Schedule H of the re of the Form 990 to improve clarity and then consistency um, between organizations, which, again, I, I do think is part of the issue that's being run into is that things maybe aren't getting tracked or reported or there's different kind of in interpretations of what should be included. Uh, the report did reference um, two states with examples of how requirements could be strength strengthened. So one is Texas that does have a percentage requirement of um, the community benefit that needs to be provided. It also has a requirement for charity care for a percentage, 4% of net patient revenue. And then Oregon doesn't have those percentages, but they do require require um, a certain level of federal poverty levels. Um, so 400% um, for subsidized or discounted and then 200% for uh, free care. Um, I will also say I'm not going to get into it. We're not going to get into it for this webinar, but many states are also um, focusing um, on tax-exempt hospitals and community benefits. And I think, you know, one focus is, you know, one effect is, well, there's tax-exempt status from income taxes. Another one, though, that affects a lot of states is there is also property tax exemption. All right, and then moving on to our last congressional kind of hot topic focus is the donor advised funds. So in spring of this year, uh, the, the Treasury Department Green Buck proposal for fiscal year 24 came out. In that, um, there were some focuses on wanting to include changes to tax law related to private foundations giving to donor advice funds um, and then also excluding administrative expenses. And these, um, those two items actually closely follow two bills that have been introduced, one in the Senate in June of 21 and then the other in the House of February 22. There has been no vote on these bills. There has been nothing kind of further done. They were introduced and as far as I know, they're just kind of still sitting there. Um, 
but uh, but it is interesting that that Congress introduced these bills in both the Senate and the House, and it's on the White House's radar of you know having this legislation and tax law changes um, changed. So. Um, with that, it proposes timeframes for donor advice funds that, you know, there needs to be distributions within a certain amount of time that can also affect when the donor to the donor advice fund can take um, the deduction. The IRS is, the Congress's concern is that donors are contributing money to a donor advice fund, getting the tax credit, and then the money is essentially just being parked in the donor advice fund and it's not being distributed out to charities to be used for charitable purposes, which is ultimately the intent um, of allowing the deduction. Um, it would also establish a what's called a qualified community foundation donor advised fund. Um, and there's certain requirements um, that would need to uh, meet that. And there, um, these two legislations also, um, the public, it affects the public support test for grantees, so the public charities that are receiving these funds. The donations would be considered to come from the donor advised fund donor versus the um, sponsoring charity or sponsoring organization. So what that means is if an individual contributes an amount to a public charity and then they contribute an amount to a donor advised fund that contributes to that same charity, under current law, the amount from the individual is considered to come from the individual. The amount from the donor advised fund is considered to be coming from the sponsoring organization. With that, when you are looking at the excess contributions for the public support test percentage, you treat them as separate. What these, what, what these um, bills would do is you have to look at as one combined. And so that could significantly impact um, the public support of some grantees. Also, there would be a 50% excise tax on um, the sponsoring charity if qualifying distributions were not made by the required date. Um, as far as private foundation impacts, uh, similar to the Green Book um, proposal, Administrative expenses paid to disqualifying persons wouldn't count as qualifying distributions. There is an, an exclusion. There's always an exclusion, it feels like. And then distribution requirements um, from a PF to a donor advised fund wouldn't be considered a qualifying distribution um, unless that donor advised fund then passed, made a qualifying distribution within the same year. Um, something that could benefit uh, private foundations is that there would be a waiver of the 1.39% excise tax on net investment income if uh, qualifying distributions were at least 7% versus the required 5% for the year. And then also if the private foundation is a limited duration private foundation um, from its formation. Um, I think Kind of wrapping up this section, I think something that I find that stands out to me and I find interesting is that all three of these topics are getting focus from the Senate and from the House. And the Senate and the House are controlled by different political parties right now. So that to me says this is likely a bi these are bipartisan focuses, you know, issues that they're focused that they're focused on. Um, and so with that, having a split government doesn't necessarily mean that these are going to, you know, stall and move forward. Um, but, you know, again, some of these things have been looked at over and over and over again. Um, so it's just, it's good to know that this is being focused on, um, but not anything kind of has moved forward that's been passed as, you know, regulations. I mean, guidance or um, new bills. Um, with that, then, we're going to jump into recent guidance. There's been some guidance that we have been waiting on for quite a while, and the IRS at conferences is that it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Well, it all came, <laughs> not all came, but it came um, this fall over the uh, last two months. And so those are the proposed regulations for donor advice funds. <clears throat> And then the final regulations for supporting organizations. 
Um, and then just kind of looking at the time, I'm probably going to go through these a little bit quicker. Um, I apologize for that because some of this is a little bit needy, but you guys do have the slides. Um, and then we're always, you know, available for follow-up questions if there are any. So the proposed regulations on donor advice funds, um, they, they closely follow and expand on notices that were issued by the IRS in 2006, 2007, 2017. So with those dates, you can see, like, we've been waiting for these for a while. The IRS has been, you know, busy and occupied with, you know, the tax law um, updates that were passed in 2017, you know, COVID pandemic. So that stuff happened. Um, the proposed regulations do provide um, definitions related to donor advice funds. They also provide exceptions to donor advice funds. And requests for comments um, are requested by January 16th of 24, so coming up here in just over a month. So the first definition is separately identifiable. So if there's any formal records that are tracked of the contribution of, um, from the donor, that is considered separately identifiable. If there is no formal records, though, it could still be considered separately identifiable based on facts and circumstances. An example that was provided in the regs was um, the fund or account balance includes investment incomes on the contributions, includes the distributions, include administrative expenses, or the supporting or, or sorry, the sponsoring organization generally solicits advice from the donor or donor advisor. For the definition of donor, they essentially said this is not what a donor is. So anything that is not this is a donor. Um, so a public charity under um, IRC sections 509A1, A2, which are meeting, you know, the public support test or your hospitals, your universities, um, or a supporting org under 509A3, except for a type three non-functionally integrated supporting organization, and then also a government entity described in Section 170C1. So those are not considered donors for purposes of a donor advised fund. A donor advisor is essentially a person appointed or designated by a donor to have advisory privileges. This has two interesting things here where um, a person who created and advises on a fund, even if they don't make any contributions to that fund, is considered a donor advisor. So a person or entity does not have to be making a donation in order to be considered a donor advisor. Um, also, another one, what I think this is, this is getting some attention and it's likely to garner probably quite a bit of, you know, comments, questions, maybe concerns is, an investment advisor who advises on the donor advised funds assets and also the personal assets of the donor to the donor advised fund would be considered a donor advisor. There is an exception if that investment advisor is providing services to the sponsoring organization as a whole. Um, and then advisory privileges, if any of these four are met, so essentially it's allowed by the sponsoring organization. There's a written agreement. It's in, indicated in marking materials that there's privileges, um, or generally they um, they do solicit for advice on the funds regarding distributions or investing the funds. There's advisory privileges. Um, when I kind of think of this, it's you don't you don't just have to have a written agreement. It's it's essentially advisory privileges in appearance means that they are. So essentially, like, if it walks like a duck, if it talks like a duck, it's a duck. If it looks like there's advisory privileges, they're more, li more likely than not is advisory privileges. And my slides have frozen. Maggie, would you be able to and refresh? Somebody could advance the slide for me. My computer is unfortunately having issues. Please hold on while we uh, uh, work through these technical difficulties. Oh, 
All right. I am back and everything is working. Great. Thank you guys for your patience. Um, so exceptions to donor advised funds, there's an exception if there's only distributions made to a single identified organization. As usual, there is exceptions to the exception. Um, so if the person reasonably expects to be able to advise the SIO on its distribution, then it does not qualify for the exception, or if the person is going to receive more than an incidental benefit. A single identified organization includes a public charity and a government entity described under these sections, which relate back to who is not a donor, um, same type of entities. It does not include private foundations, disqualified supporting organizations, foreign organizations, or non-charitable organizations. And this, there's a formatting error on here that non-charitable organizations should not be under foreign organizations. U.S. charitable, non-charitable organizations um, are not included as single identified organizations. Um, another exception is, you know, for certain grants to individuals for travel study or similar purposes, the donor, donor advisor, and invitee can be on the selection committee. Um, provided that um, they're advising exclusively as a member of the committee, not as a donor advisor or donor. Um, the sponsoring organization is selecting the committee members. Um, there's no combination of donors, donor advisors, and related persons that control the committee directly or indirectly. Um, and that grants are awarded on an objective, non-discriminatory non basis under pre-approved written procedures, which essentially these are the requirements for private foundations to be able to um, give grants to individuals for these items. Another exception is disaster relief fund if it meets the requirements of IRC section 139. So. COVID and the pandemic that we went through, that was a prime example of, um, you know, a disaster that qualified under 139. It does not extend to emergency hardship funds, however, the IRS, because the IRS says as the sponsoring organization or advisory committee would determine what constitutes an emergency hardship versus, you know, a government entity determining what is a disaster. Um, also, social welfare, organ welfare organizations, so a fund or account that's established by a C4 organization where the purpose is to provide scholarships in individuals, um, and the other requirements here are, are fairly similar to what in generally is required for a scholarship fund. Uh, another thing regarded to, related to taxable distributions that would be looked at is um, there'd be essentially a distribution look through. So an example of this would be if a advisor advises a sponsoring organization to make a dis distribution from a DAF to a charity, and then the donor goes and arranges with that charity to give the funds to a recommended individual. A advisor cannot advise a DAF to give to a specific individual. And now giving, having, you know, putting the public charity kind of in between that doesn't get around that um, restriction um, either. So there's essentially kind of a look through that gets, um, that gets done. And then it did clarify uh, the excise taxes um, that are subject. So it's 20% of the taxable distribution on the sponsoring organization and then 5% of taxable distributions on a fund manager that knowingly agreed to make the taxable distribution. Um, there is, so, th and that qualifies, it's not just that they made the final approval. If they were included in the discussion, included in any kind of manifestation of the approval, then they could still be subject to the 5%. All right, so then the other um, regulations that came out, or the final regulations, these came out in October of this year. Um, it mostly adopts the 2016 proposed regulations, and it applies to tax years beginning after 
the date um, of issuance of the final regulations. Um, it, so there is a prohib, um, prohib, prohibition of gifts being given to type one or type three organization, supporting organizations by individuals that are considered to control them. So the final regu regulations pro de provided a, def a definition of control. So it's essentially a person or entity that holds more than 50% of the voting power of the governing body or can excise veto power over the actions of the governing body. Just because though somebody doesn't have these authority, that can still be considered to have control based on facts and circumstances. An entity in this case does not include a public charity under 509A1, 509A2, or publicly safety testing organization under a fi under 509A4. So those are excluded from um, the definition of control. It also included when a type three qualifies as a functionally integrated supporting um, supporting a government organization. Um, it defines that a government unit is, or a government organization is a government unit described in IRC Section 170C2 as well as Section 170D1A and is not a private foundation or a supporting organization. A supporting organization may support more than one governmental organization, um, and it's still considered functionally integrated as long as those government organizations work in close coordination and collaboration. There was a requirement under the proposed regulations that they all be in the same geographical location. That is no longer a requirement under the final regs. Um, the supporting organization is required to have either a joint or separate letter from each entity describing the coordination collaboration that is happening and a substantial part of the supporting organization's activities must directly further the government organization's exempt purpose. Um, it also um, went into kind of more of the requirements of a type three functionally integrated that isn't supporting um, a government organization. In the proposed regulations, it they specifically mentioned health systems because usually the parent organization of a health system has public charity status as a type three functionally integrated supporting organization. Um, the final regs did clarify um, that that an organization meet you know it qualifies this by meeting the requirements and not just by the industry type. So just because it's related to a health system doesn't automatically mean that it qualifies for this um, status. And that other kind of systems or groups of organizations could also qualify for this. It's not just health systems. This is just mainly where we, we see it most frequently. Um, so the notification requirement, um, the regulations clarify that the required information has to be given by the end of the fifth month after the tax year ends. So if we have a 1231 year at tax year end, that would be the end of May. Um, responsiveness test, um, supported orgs have to have a significant voice. Um, this has to be met for each of its supported organizations. There was also an example provided of if a supported org doesn't have a governance role with the supporting organization, how uh, that can kind of be met around meetings and um, whatnot. The integral part test, which is the third requirement, um, it clarified that it requires a parent to direct overall policies, programs, and activities of its supported organization. It also added that it must have the ability to remove and replace or otherwise appoint with reasonable frequency a majority of the board in addition to the ability to appoint or elect. So in the past it was, they had to have the authority to appoint or elect. Now they have added that there also needs the ability to remove and replace. Um, it also talks on or covers, um, clarifies the distribution requirements because of timing we're gonna, I'm gonna move past that. And then also it stated that a supporting organizations may not receive contributions from other supporting organizations that controls a common supported organization. With that, we are gonna move on to a, our fourth polling question. Danielle. Thank you, Colleen. Here we have our final poll. Which one of the legislative acts are you most interested in? A, tax extenders, 
B, Legacy IRA Act, C, ACE Act, D, All, E, None. For those of you that would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them from the folder that says Slide Deck and Handouts. We will also be sending them out via email tomorrow along with a recording of the webcast. And once you've completed all of the CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your certificate from the CPE progress window. I'll leave this up here for just a few more seconds to gather a few more responses from our audience. And I'll push us to the results. Thank you, Danielle. Looks like most are interested in everything um, with a small percentage or a quarter uh, of people not interested in any of these. So thank you for that. And with that, we'll wrap up with our hot topics. So the Supreme Court, Harvard, and the University of North Carolina decision, um, this was voted on on June 29th, 2023, so this past summer. And with a vote of six to three, the Supreme Court rejected affirmative action at colleges and universities around the nation, declaring essentially that the race conscious admissions programs at Harvard and the University of North Carolina were unlawful and sharply curtailing a policy that had long been a pillar of higher education. Um, this primarily now affects <clears throat> impacted universities and colleges. However, there, we do expect to see some implications of this um, going forward. For example, advocacy groups are likely to press new challenges to race conscious philanthropy. Um, litigants are likely to challenge any racial equity or DEI program that appears to grant advantages on the basis of race and gender. Um, and then the IRS regulations under Section 501c3 provide that eliminating discrimination is a charitable purpose. Therefore, there is no impact on mission or tax exemption from that perspective. However, it may affect how a mission or programs are carried out uh, to avoid the race-based selection criteria in grants, for example. That's a perfect example. Broaden the selection criteria um, and target the historically black colleges and universities and similar organizations. The one other item that I wanted to mention before I turn it back to Colleen to wrap up is the employee retention tax credit. Both there's still time, credit can still be claimed for 20 and 2021. And here's some additional information of what those amounts and qualifiers are. However, the there has been a moratorium issued on September 14th that's planned to last through at least the end of the year, as there has been an extreme volume of false and wrong fi and um, wrong filings for this. Um, there's been essentially scams and ERTC mills, as we call them, where they're just processing them for organizations. And we hear this from clients all the time that they're reaching out to them and even organizations that have no employees are receiving these letters. So um, please know there's time if you're truly eligible, but um, those that may have submitted something that were not eligible or not sure if they are, there is a withdrawal opportunity that was issued on September 14th and it allows taxpayers to withdraw and claim as if it was never filed. And with that, I will turn it over to Kalima to talk about remote employees. All right, I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulties, but we're coming here to the end. And so I just want to thank you, Maggie and Colleen, for a great presentation today. Uh, to our audience, if you have any further questions or comments, please reach out to us as we would be happy to continue the conversation. You can drop a note in the Q&A window or reach out to Maggie and Colleen directly. Their contact information is in your console. 
If you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. A copy will be emailed within two weeks if you have difficulty downloading it now. Finally, here's a link to the survey for today's presentation. Your feedback is appreciated, and thank you again for joining us. Take care, everyone.